Right, I think we'll get started because we've got a lot to get through in this section session today. Um, a big welcome to everyone. Um, we have some fantastic speakers for you today. And this has actually been one of the most uh, popular sessions we've, we've advertised. So it's great to have such a large number of people uh, still coming in. So um, if people want to introduce themselves in the using the chat function, so that's absolutely fine. And please do use that throughout. So my name's Annette Boaz. I'm with Fiona Aspinall. I'm, I'm going to be chairing this session. So the session is 75 minutes long. We're going to have 20 minute presentations from each of our presenters, uh, but then lots of time for discussion. So if we could move on to the next slide. Thanks, Sylvie. So um, we're going to hear from three great speakers in this space, leaders in thinking about the use of research in social care. This is such an important topic. And when we started out with this latest generation of work on the ARCs, the Applied Research Collaborations funded by NIHR, one of the critical changes from the last iteration was a shift in emphasis towards more social care, the importance of social care in, in the UK, and getting social care research to be a more critical and central part of the agenda. I think reflected in the fantastic turnout for this event today, uh, this is an interest that's shared across um, many of us. And uh, this is our opportunity to hear from first from John Glasby, who's leading the ESRC um, Health Foundation Centre, the Impact Centre, which is specifically focusing on evidence use in adult social care. And it's going to be great to hear from John about that work that's just getting underway now. Then we'll hear from Juliet Malley, who leads an ESRC uh, funded study uh, looking at innovation in adult social care. And that work is kind of just sort of starting to really ge generate lots of interesting findings. So we'll hear about some of that fresh off the press um, and before many others from Juliet today. And then last and definitely not least, uh, Lisa Trigg, who is working at the forefront of putting evidence into practice in social care in Wales, thinking about all the different elements of that around capacity, research use, um, and building a kind of system really that is, is better prepared to help us with evidence use across Wales. So we're going to have each of those speakers, as I said, for talking for 20 minutes uh, and then lots of time to hear from you from your questions. So if you want to put questions in the chat as we go along, that would be great. Um, or if you want to store them up and just to warn you, if you don't have any questions, I get to ask all my questions and you have to listen to those. So please, if you have questions, um, store them up and we will have plenty of time to come to those at the end. But before, I don't want to use any more time up now because I want to give the most time to our presenters. And we're going to go first to John. So I'm going to hand over to you now, John. Thank you so much. Thanks, Annette. And thank you for the invitation to, to be here today. And uh, hello and, and welcome to everybody. So my name's John Glasby and I, I work at the University of Birmingham, but I'm also the uh, lead of IMPACT, the new UK centre for implementing evidence in adult social care. And uh, when I trained as a, as a social worker, someone who uh, went on to be quite senior in social care actually said, uh, you'll make a good social worker, John. The trouble is you think too much. Um, now, I know what they meant. Um, sometimes you have to ask questions carefully, don't you? You have to kind of walk before you can run. Uh, sometimes you have to earn the right to ask questions. Uh, you have to ask questions in a way that the other person can hear. I'm sure I was a really, really irritating uh, student. Uh, but the way it was framed, you think too much is really really interesting um with something as important as adult social care with something that touches people's lives in such fundamental and intimate ways um how could we ever possibly think too much uh, i also wonder if it's something that we would have said to a different kind of welfare professional a, a doctor for example um as i say i'm sure i was very brash and very naive but i think the young me was trying to say uh, why are things like this how could they be different in future and could i play a role um, in some of that and those are questions that i'd want all of us to be asking of our practice and our our, our services in social care and uh, across uh, welfare professions more generally now against that background we've been really delighted to receive uh, 15 million pounds of funding from the src and the health foundation to design and then deliver a UK centre for implementing evidence in, in adult social care. Uh, there are 13 uh, organisations across the UK that, that make up the leadership team of the centre, five universities and eight policy and practice partners that include uh, user-led organisations and carers organisations. 
Impact is very definitely uh, an implementation centre, not a research centre. It's about taking evidence that already exists and getting it used in practice to make a difference to services and hence to people's lives. And we're really proud of the UK wide nature of the centre, that ability to work within the four very different policy and practice contexts of the, of the four nations of the UK, uh, as well as sharing lessons learned across those boundaries. Hopefully of interest today, we're adopting a very broad uh, definition of evidence. And, and so when I talk about evidence of what works, I'm referring to knowledge in different types of research. I'm talking about the lived experience of, of people who draw on care and support and carers and the practice knowledge of people who work in social care services. And we're seeing research, lived experience and practice knowledge as three uh, potentially different but, but complementary ways of knowing the world that are all important in their own right and that we need to bring together to triangulate and then to work with if we're going to bring people together from different backgrounds and different parts of the system to work on common challenges and hopefully on uh, common solutions. And some of the delivery models that I'll share with you in a moment are designed to be very embedded in the realities of local practice, but then to take lessons learned uh, from that local work and try to find ways to embed them in national uh, policy and, and practice systems so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Very briefly, we've been given four main objectives by our funders about supporting more widespread use of evidence in adult social care, about building capacity and skills to work with evidence, about uh, facilitating more sustainable and productive relationships in a, in a sector that to me often feels very, very fragmented. And then in the process, trying to understand more about what helps and what hinders when we're thinking about implementation in adult social care. Our funders gave us three phases. So uh, last year we had a co-design phase when we were working with the sector across the four nations and in all its diversity to, uh, to really understand what impact should do, um, how it should fit alongside what already works well, um, how it should design its priorities. We're now moving into a, a 12 month establishment phase where we get set up as a, as a UK wide centre uh, before hopefully moving into a five year delivery period. And the longer term aspiration is that the centre, or at least some of its key functions, become more permanent features of the, the social care landscape. I should just say with the establishment phase that we're in right now, that that is partly about getting set up as a, as a UK wide centre. Uh, but we also want it to be a very active delivery orientated phase when we're piloting a number of proposed delivery models in different locations across the UK uh, and learning by by doing so that we've tested some of those models in reality before we roll them out uh, at, a, a more, uh, at a wider scale uh, from 2023 onwards. Very briefly, during the co-design uh, phase, just so that you understand the which we're making some of the, the subsequent observations. We did a number of things. Um, we met with individual stakeholders across the sector. Um, I personally met with about 120 uh, adult social care organisations and key stakeholders uh, from user led organisations through to national uh, bodies to uh, talk about the kind of work programme that we might shape and to work how we would add value to what already exists. Uh, we carried out an online survey and the results of that are available on the impact website um, there are over 2000 people um, completed that uh, proportionate to the different populations of the uk uh, wales was slightly overrepresented england slightly less so but but broadly what you would expect from the uh, the populations of the, the different nations uh, and about 45 percent of people were either people who currently draw on care and support carers or frontline um, practitioners um, so there's some really, really rich data um, from that survey. We also have five impact assemblies, uh, one each in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and uh, two in England. And each of those is made up of about 30 to 35 people who draw on care and support, who are carers, who are frontline practitioners, uh, service providers, commissioners, researchers, and others. Uh, and those provide um, a degree of more bottom up uh, challenge and um, support as we're shaping our thinking and our work. 
Uh, we have a lived experience engagement lead who's working with uh, co-production networks and with user and carer-led organisations uh, across the UK. Uh, and there's various um, further pieces of background information on, uh, an, on an initial holding website listed on the slide if um, that's of interest. When it came to some of the messages that we heard last year, um, there was very strong support for um, knowledge constituting those insights from those different types of different ways of knowing the world, uh, research, lived experience and, and practice knowledge. That th Those approaches were widely uh, valued by our participants in the survey, for example. Uh, people felt that all three were important. They said um, often it's research that's seen as the most valid and it's particular forms of research that get prioritised, particularly a quantitative economic form of research. And so participants valued research in all, in its, all its diversity, as well as lived experience and practice knowledge. And many of our assemblies felt that if we, uh, we should work with all three of those, but if you had to turn up the volume on, on two of those, it would be turning up the volume on lived experience and practice knowledge, because those are often seen as less valid ways of knowing the world or deciding what we ought to do than particular forms of, of research. We asked people um, what they thought influenced what actually happens in, in adult social care. And people said what happens is mainly influenced by funding. It's also influenced by national uh, politics and by local politics. It's, issue, it's influenced by what providers want to offer. It's influenced by what we've always done in the past. It's influenced by um, the bright idea of an individual local leader or, or commissioner. Slightly depressingly, people didn't think what happens in social care was influenced by good practice from other local authorities, from other sectors, uh, from other countries. And they didn't think it was influenced by evidence of what works. To try and do something about that though, people didn't want more evidence necessarily, or, or even kind of training to understand the evidence that's, that's out there. Uh, they really drew attention to three things that they wanted impact to focus on and that they thought would, uh, would really help. And um, I'm sure this will fit with some of the messages from other speakers today. Lisa's been doing amazing work with Social Care Wales for many years, trying to explore these issues in more detail, uh, for example. But in our survey, people said what would help is uh, practical support to make changes on the ground in the reality of uh, current services. Uh, a lot of people thought that um, social care often hasn't had much support uh, to do that compared to other sectors. But that in some parts of the UK, the austerity agenda in particular uh, led to a very significant reduction in the amount of support that was available to bring about change. When councils are under financial pressure, we would often cut training budgets and research budgets and improvement budgets to, to kind of focus on frontline delivery. You know, quite uh, so that actually over the last 10 years or so, whilst we never had much support to make change on the ground, perhaps we've got even less now than we had um, in the early to mid 2000s in an English context, uh, for example. So people wanted practical support on the ground. Um, they wanted funding to enable the participation of people who draw on care and support, uh, carers and frontline practitioners, particularly very low paid care workers, uh, groups who might not otherwise be able to um, participate. And they also wanted something of a convening role, uh, an opportunity for people to come together from different parts of the system to work on practical changes together. And a real sense of a, of a fragmented system, which um, often lacks shared spaces for, for people to come together to, to actually talk to each other or understand each other's uh, perspectives. There was a very strong emphasis throughout all that engagement work on learning by doing and on implementing evidence in the reality of local services and the reality of people's lives. Um, not just talking about it, John, but rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty was the way that one of our service users described the way that they wanted to see the centre uh, operating. And uh, people wanted to learn by doing and reflecting um, and evolving their approaches over time. Um, it felt a very kind of hands-on, real-world way of 
wanting to talk about evidence and wanting to to learn uh, and to improve that possibly is a little bit different to some of the improvement models that people perceived at least in in other sectors like parts of the health service uh, for example um, we asked people about some of the topics that they thought we should work on and the the, the key ones that emerged if this is of interest were around uh, prevention and well-being around um, kind of asset-based and more person-centered approaches around the health and well-being of carers and around the well-being of people who work in, in adult social care. Uh, there was also recognition that we should be focusing on adult social care in its own right, which is often neglected or seen as a, as a kind of adjunct to the health service, but the impact should also recognise the interfaces with, um, with other sectors, particularly with health and with housing, or perhaps with um, children's services when it comes to issues of transition. And our mission is, uh, or our, our sort of strap line is that the good support isn't just about services, it's about having a life. So by definition, that needs to be quite a broad, multifaceted approach if we're going to recognize some of the, the breadth of things that go into making up not just a service, but a, but a good life. In terms of topic areas, a, a close contender as well, beyond the ones listed was around the needs of people who might fund their own care or be on the edge of services and not yet eligible for public um, support. People were clear with us that our establishment phase, um, as I said earlier, shouldn't just be about getting up and running as a, as a national centre, but should be really active and delivery focused, working alongside people on the ground to make a difference and to test uh, our four delivery models uh, in practice before uh, they're rolled out. Um, it was really interesting, although I've said the sector is very fragmented and although that's been my experience over time, um, actually these messages were very consistent across all four nations and indeed across all the different stakeholder groups. Somebody drawing on care and support um, gave virtually the same answers in our survey as a director of social services and that was the same as a carer and the same as someone that ran a chain of care homes. Um, we might have different solutions to some of the dilemmas that we, we, we face, or we might be starting in different places, but actually people's uh, views on some of the issues that I've shared with you today were, were, were remarkably consistent across geography and uh, across stakeholder group. And a strong sense as well for, for people that um, my slightly ambiguous final bullet point on this slide, you know, with everything that we've got going on and everything that we've been through and the tragedy and, and the service pressures we're facing, you know, in one sense, there's never been a worse time to try and set up a centre like this. Um, equally, everyone's talking about social care in a way that hasn't been the case before. And lots of people are saying and concluding that things need to be different and they need to be better in future. So maybe there's never been a worse time to set up a centre like this. And, you know, maybe there's never been a better time. And it's quite possible that those two sentences are both true at, at, at once. They sound mutually incompatible, but I'm, I'm not sure they are actually. So rising out of that, we have four delivery models that we'll be testing uh, later on in 2020. 22 and then rolling out more, uh, uh, more broadly in 2023 onwards. For big strategic change issues, we'll be running a series of impact demonstrators where a pair of coaches, perhaps somebody from a change background and someone with lived experience or practice knowledge would work together in a local area to facilitate an evidence-informed long-term change project, maybe for 12 to 18 months. In the process, they support support local services to carry out an evaluation and then they'd work with national policymakers to try and embed the lessons learned. So if a question was um, how do you help people with learning disabilities come out of long stay hospital and lead more ordinary lives in the community? Something like that might be quite amenable to one of our demonstrator sites uh, doing that work on the ground with a local system or set of services uh, and the product might be a just hypothetically, a change in the way that we register and inspect long stay hospitals or a, a change in the social work curriculum so that we educate practitioners differently in future or a new service specification that one of our third sector partners pioneers, for example. Secondly, we will have impact networks, and these are for common everyday issues with a, a, where we set up a series of local groups around the country, all working on the same issue in their local area, made up of users, carers, practitioners and managers. Uh, they'd get some stimulus material from us to start them off, and they'd work over a six month period on that practical issue uh, with quite a structured way of meeting and then of feeding back 
what they'd done, what impact it had, what barriers they faced, how they got round it, what happened next. And that would be collated from across all the groups and shared back with them before their next meeting. So that the network is a kind of network of networks, if you like. Um, just hypothetically, if you have an older couple and someone deteriorates and needs to be admitted into a care home, um, it's really traumatic for the couple. There's lots of practical service issues, and I suspect we do it really, really badly at the moment. That doesn't need a major strategic or expensive change initiative to, to do something about. It's just really hard. Uh, and actually a series of local groups, all very action orientated, but with a learning linked across them might make real inroads into a topic like that. Um, our, our third model we're calling impact facilitators and there that's more of a change agent model where the facilitator would be based in a local service for about 12 months uh, facilitating a, a more bottom-up local uh, evidence-informed change project and then ask impact would receive uh, common queries or challenges from people using or working in social care services they'd theme those together and where there were some common questions they would produce some very accessible evidence-informed uh, guidance to respond to that or issue uh, over time building up a much more uh, a, a sort of trusted repository of very accessible um, evidence so in 2022, um, these are the kind of pilots that we hope you'll see. Uh, a demonstrator site in Northern Ireland looking at assets-based approaches for older people. Uh, a facilitator project in Scotland on use of technology to remodel home care. Uh, a project in Wales on support for carers of people with dementia at end of life. And a project in England uh, on personalisation and people from black and minority ethnic communities. And then two networks, one on choice and control in supported living and one on um, recruitment and retention, probably having a focus on uh, values-based recruitment. Uh, initially, we'll be running those pilots with some existing partners or areas where work is already underway. But from 2023 onwards, there'll be a, a simple but, but an, and a more transparent process for areas of the country or services to, to apply to be considered uh, to, to, to be a, a, a site to work with us with some of these um, kind of models as well. So I hope that's a helpful kind of insight into uh, what impact is and, and what it's doing, but, but perhaps more uh, of interest for today, some of the themes that have come back from our assemblies, uh, from our stakeholder engagement uh, and from our, our survey. There's a holding website um, listed on the slide, which gives you a bit more background in case that's helpful. And people can sign up for to go on a mailing list for some regular updates. Uh, there's also some scope uh, for user and care-led organisations and community groups that are working with uh, people whose voices are seldom heard to add a bit more um, information via that sign up so that we can stay in particular uh, contact with them over time. But going back to where I started, uh, you know, me as that young, irritating, naive social work student, I, I think we'll know that a, that a centre like Impact has made a difference over time if, you know, by the end of the centre's uh, funding period, that, you know, that social work student says, well, look, why do we do things like this? And then rather than kind of closing them down, you think too much, the manager or the, the, the senior practitioner or whoever it is says, well, actually, we do it like that because there's really good evidence uh, based on research, based on the lived experience of people's lives, based on what we know in frontline practice. There's really good evidence that it makes a difference to how we deliver care and to the outcomes that that care receives for people who draw on care and support uh, and families. Uh, and that to me would be a sign of, of, of success for a centre-like impact. And that's, I think that's my 20 minutes. So if it's okay, I will mute myself and I'll stop sharing my slides and hand back over to you. Thank you, John. That was so interesting and such a lot of information for us about all the work you've been doing. So really appreciate that and your fantastic timekeeping. You set the bar there exactly to the minute. Um, there are a couple of kind of quite direct questions for you about kind of information in the chat. So if you get a chance to look at those, that would be great. Um, but we'll, we'll return to the more substantive questions at the end. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Juliet. Okay, great. Well, thank you for inviting me to come um, and speak today um, to you on this uh, webinar. Um, but just hearing John speak, I, I realised that I need some anecdotes for my speaking, but I, I don't have any, which is a bit sad. So I'm going to have to go away and work on that much more. So I'm going to talk to you today <laughs> um, without anecdotes about 
um, uh, some of the kind of early findings really from the first phase of the um, SASCI project. That's our supporting adult social care innovation project. Um, so it's um, funded by the ESRC. Um, it's led by me um, from LSC, but it involves um, a kind of array of um, partners um, from practice um, and also colleagues from um, other universities, including KCL, York, and LSHGM. Um, and you know we've really drawn on everyone's kind of input as we've been developing um, this uh, research project and kind of working on kind of findings from this first phase. So I just wanted to really acknowledge everyone's input um, to what I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay, so just a bit of um, background uh, to the Saski project I thought would be helpful. Um, so the kind of core problem that Saski is really interested in is trying to understand um, is this problem around innovation. So we see, and this is repeated in the recent white paper, putting people at the heart of care um, by DHSC, that innovation is really seen as key to solving many of the problems that there are in adult social care, um, improving quality of care and really leading to the kind of transformation that we hope to see in the sector to deliver on the, on the care. But there's also at the same time this real sense that although there might be quite a lot of innovations out there, rarely are these kind of getting through. They sort of stay on the periphery. They rarely make it through and become um, part of the mainstream practice. So for us, for SASCI, the question is really kind of why is this the case? And then trying to help the sector. So then trying to build evidence about how we can resolve some of these issues, how we can support the sector to really start up, implement, spread. Um, particularly thinking about kind of affordable innovations, given the context that really work well for everyone. So deliver on those values that really are important for the sector. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the white paper really reiterates this kind of issue that's, that's right there at the heart of Saski, but it also really helpfully, I think, commits a small amount of money, it should be noted, but does commit to um, really uh, investing in supporting innovation within the sector, so helping places within, within uh, uh, the UK to move um, uh, their innovations from that kind of periphery um, into the mainstream. So that's great for Saski. It means we kind of have a constituency for the project findings, for the work. But I think there's also something else that's really interesting when you look at the white paper and that really, again, kind of gets to the core of Saski and what it's about and emphasizes why it's important. And that's that the white paper really relies very, very heavily on experiential knowledge. And that's not a bad thing. It's really important to hear the voices of people in the sector. But it's very, very kind of weak, really, in terms of the sort of scientific evidence. There's very few references. And I don't think that's because they've done a bad job. I think that genuinely reflects the situation that there is with respect to understanding and thinking about innovation in adult social care and thinking about how we can support innovation in particular in our social care. And that's, a, you know, there are quite a few studies, people have looked at innovation, but there just isn't a real body of research on which to base and which to think about this question of how we can support the sector to innovate. Um, so when it came to us thinking about how we could, were going to start this study, what we were gonna look at, how we were gonna enter, how can we think about, um, you know, supporting the sector to innovate, we were also sort of struggling to think about, well, how can we build the evidence base? Because on the one hand, we know that there isn't very much about innovation in adult social care. But on the other hand, there is an absolutely vast literature on innovation. And surely a lot of that is going to be really relevant to the adult social care context. But the question is, what's going to be relevant? What can we use to help us really understand and get underneath this problem? So the first phase of the work was really about it was very exploratory. It was about conceptualizing innovation in our social care better and trying to characterize um, innovation so that we could really sort of surface those issues, situate it within the wider literature, describe innovation, find a language for describing innovation in our social care that, that really worked and spoke to the kind of key features of, of um, adult social care. OK, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there were three things that we really did as part of this exploratory phase. The first was a mapping of the field. Essentially, what that was was us putting together a database of innovations um, and then looking at all those innovations and trying to kind of describe them and categorize them in lots of different ways in order to try and understand what, what innovation looked like. 
The second was a review of the literature, as I've already suggested, this was quite a difficult thing to do, given it's incredibly scattered. Um, and so what we ended up doing was um, taking a kind of theoretical perspective and placing that over the literature in order to interpret it. And I'll speak a little bit more about that because that was a slightly different way of doing things. And then we also had, as John did indeed with his work, a, a huge number of discussions with stakeholders, informal, formal interviews and workshops, and a lot of talking to our partners from practice, our advisory group, with our slightly inchoate kind of ideas as, as we went along really, and just building that into our thinking. Okay, so the first thing to say about this first phase of the work, and I think the kind of primary key, well, the key finding really from the work is, that when we spoke to stakeholders and when we looked at our kind of innovations database and all the innovations that we gathered, um, a really, really complex picture emerged of innovation in, in our social care. Complex in the sense of, you know, this mixed economy and there was a huge amount of complexity in how the different the types of organisations that are innovating, what was going on, et cetera, within the sector. But that just was not reflected at all in the literature that we were able to find about innovation. Um, and that's not to say that there wasn't of any commonality. Um, there definitely were some issues that were consistently identified across. So collaboration was something that just came up for everyone, but the kind of complexity of, of, of you know, how and why people were collaborating certainly wasn't there in the literature. The other thing that was very strong was this um, issue that you know, John really raised as well around the kind of use of research evidence and the kind of capacity for people to use research is clearly an issue that people think about in the context of innovation and needs addressing. So, you know, it may be, well, the one thing that kind of, you know, was very strong then for work was that we had, you know, a huge number of absences really in the literature just weren't there, weren't covered. And it may be that the absences are there because of something to do with the way that we were kind of trying to find uh, literature. But I think it's much more likely that it's actually just a consequence of the type of studies that are being done in adult social care. So this is not to say that it's bad research. There's lots of really, really good research, but it's very, very narrow, focused on really single case studies of innovations or evaluation of those innovations in a single site, very, very focused on implementation and, and not really addressing the kind of development phase, sustainability spread of the innovations at all. So the reason I say this <laughs> is, uh, is because the absences of the literature are really informing the work that we're doing as part of the second phase of SASCI. So we have case studies where we're looking at organisations as innovators, systems as innovators, looking at the development, growth and spread of innovations over time across multiple sites. That's our focus and also picking up on some of the other things there. Um, but I realized telling you <laughs> that, uh, you know, there are all these absences in the literature isn't very helpful in terms of answering that kind of question that I think I said and kind of promised you I'd talk about, which is how we go about supporting innovation in the sector. Because I'm just telling you that, well, down the line, there's going to be lots and lots of really in interesting findings that are going to really help with that question. But for DHSC, for thinking about implementing the white paper, you know, we need to be able to give, you know, evidence now. How can we support them with that question? So what I want to do with the rest of the talk is really a couple of things. First, I want to talk about the, the mapping of the innovations that we did, just to give you a little bit more of a picture of why some of these absences matter. And secondly, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the literature review and what we found from the literature review that we think might be useful for answering this question of how we can support innovation in the sector. Okay. So, in terms of mapping the fields, as I said, this was a kind of database of innovations, essentially, that we had. We, it was not a literature review that we did. We just drew on innovations from funders' websites. There's lots of directories out there. There was a really wonderful, extremely useful report from Grace that was done that we drew on. And we kind of compiled, compiled them all together and set about kind of putting attributes and uh, looking at the innovations in lots of different ways. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of findings that I think are really useful from, from that work, quite interesting. So as I said, we defined innovation in lots and lots of different ways, described it in lots of different ways through this, this mapping process. But one of the um, ways of categorizing innovations that we found particularly useful was this distinction between what we call systems-based innovations where the kind of momentum for the innovation, its development, its uh, you know, progress is really based within the group of organizations 
that sit within a particular area. And you compare that to organization-based innovations, and that's where the momentum for the innovation, for its growth, its development, indeed its spread, sits with a single organization. So you can see in our database, many more of them were those organization-based innovations. And just to give you an example of the types of things that would fit with the organization base, we're talking about shared lives, things like equal care co-op, there's gig bodies, different types of care organizations that are considered to be innovative. And the system space would be things more like the Thorough Better Care Together initiative that I'm sure some people have heard of and lots of this sort of social care digital innovation program example. So the reason that I find this distinction quite useful is because it really helps you to understand the different types of elements that need to come together in order to get innovation to happen. But it was also when we started to look at the types of um, innovations that were fitting under these categories that other elements started to emerge and became uh, quite interesting. So the one I've kind of highlighted here is the fact that when we looked at the organization-based innovations, we found that a third of them at least had this coordinating body, what we call a kind of coordinating body that was linking together and connecting instances of the innovation together. So those coordinating bodies had different, looked slightly different. So they were kind of members or sort of almost proto-trade association type bodies. There were ones that were more like a network or an institute and others that were more like a franchise. So Good Gym would be a good example of the franchise. Um, the UK meeting centres, the, the more institutes and shared lives plus is a very good example of, of, of the kind of members networks. But the reason why this was quite interesting and I highlight it is because these features that we're picking out here were actually really interestingly quite related to spread. And when we come back to this question of how do we help the sector to grow, develop, spread innovation, actually it, it's really important because these are the features that seem, that seem to be quite critical to try to help answer that question. So just connecting, I think hopefully this chart starts to show um, what I'm saying. Um, so you can see the systems-based innovations are in blue and the organization-based innovations are in green, uh, gray rather. And you can see that the organization-based innovations are much more likely to be found across many local authority or authority areas, whereas the uh, system-based ones are really found within you know, one particular site. And I think the point further to make about this is that the innovations that had a court of the organization based ones, the ones that had a coordinating body, were much more likely to be spreading to multiple sites, to be found across multiple sites, and also interestingly, were much more likely to be found internationally as well. So I guess the key point to take from this, really, and particularly when we think about what, what uh, back to what I was saying about the literature before, that it focused particularly on innovations happening in a, you know, in a given site. Actually, if we want to be understanding growth and spread of innovations, really, we should be looking much more at these organizations as innovators and trying to understand innovation from their perspective rather than what's happening in an individual site. And the other interesting thing to look at would be to understand the role of this coordinating body and its role potentially in ensuring growth of innovations. Okay, so coming to the to the literature review. So this is like a bit of a whistle stop tour through all the things that we've been doing. But coming to the literature review. So as I mentioned, this was really quite challenging for us to do. The core cool thing that we wanted to get out of the literature review was really to understand how to situate innovation in adult social care within the broader, you know, massive, vast literature that there is around innovation? What could we use that's going to help us to understand uh, what's going on in the sector? Um, but we realised it was going to be really difficult to use kind of standard processes to do this. So the literature that we knew was out there, we see from a kind of bit of scoping that we did, wasn't really very strongly theoretical. It kind of didn't engage with the wider innovation literature particularly. So it'd be very difficult to, to think from that, you know, what would be relevant. So what we decided to do instead was essentially kind of plump for a theoretical perspective and then apply that to, you know, identify um, studies and interpret, almost kind of reinterpret really the evidence that we found um, within that literature. So what we looked at was um, some ideas from resource-based view, which was really around kind of the idea of some sort of organizational capabilities and that organizations need particular in order to kind of uh, 
innovate and to to have um, to, to perform better, essentially. So we took that perspective and applied it um, to the literature out there. And this is what we found. So our first question was really around, you know, can we identify capabilities that organisations need in order to innovate? And I think we were pretty successful in being able to do that from the literature that, that we found. So we were able to identify a set of capabilities that seemed important. So collaboration, as I've mentioned, absolutely critical. Leadership, again, comes through as really important. Learnings, the ability to learn to improve the innovations, but also improve your ability to innovate as well, really important. The other things that came through was the uh, need for certain resources for innovation, knowledge, um, particularly a skilled workforce, finance. <laughs> These things were, were critical, as I'm sure you would expect. And culture also comes through as a, an enabling condition for innovation. So I think the first thing that struck us when we you know, came out with this list was that there's just you know, really significant crossover between what we see here and what you would expect to find if you were like looking through the kind of general change or general innovation literature. So that would say to us one thing that's really good, which is that that wider innovation literature is absolutely going to be applicable in the adult social care context. It's not exceptional. Adult social care isn't exceptional. It's definitely going to apply. We can use it to understand and help us think about innovation. But the other thing that comes through from that really is the fact that there was such limited evidence of this wider literature really informing research and what's going on in adult social care. And that really seems to be a, a kind of a missed opportunity, I think. And hopefully we can try to work you know, now forwards and try to address that and really use what's out there to help us think about how to improve and how we innovate in the sector. But just to illustrate why we make that point about it being a missed opportunity, so the second part of our kind of question after we'd identified, you know, what are the capabilities that we need to innovate was to understand, well, how, how can organisations go about developing and growing these capabilities within this context? Um, and that's where we really struggled to answer that question from the literature we had. We just really got quite kind of limited insight into that. Um, so there were a few papers um, where they had taken a much more kind of theoretical perspective or investigated a particular model. And those examples really did give a bit more direction as to you know, how you might do this. Um, so just giving you some examples here of the sort of champions uh, approach um, that was tried in one paper, a sort of strategic partnership approach in another. And then you know, the theoretical idea here of institutional entrepreneurs is another example. But I think the, the kind of key thing that really came across was just we ended up with a lot more questions really than, than we had answers for, for this. So you know, I couldn't tell you, for example, what type of leadership you might need to innovate. So there are some big kind of holes there that, that really need addressing moving forward. If we think about, you know, how we can actually support organisations that innovate, there are some clear directions that, that need sorting, that need addressing. Um, but the other thing, but there was one thing that I think was really quite helpful um, for the sector thinking about moving forward. And that was, was that there were some kind of key issues that seemed to occur across a lot of these studies that seem to be important for the uh, social care context and do need addressing. So, I mean, this was mentioned by John as well, but really the kind of weaknesses in the context around finances and workforce. I can't tell you how many papers, and I think Valentina's listening, who did this work with me, was, was the test to this, how many papers they kind of found at the end that finances and workforce were a problem and that's why everything sort of failed. And after you've read that for sort of five or six, seven or eight times, you start to think, why are we doing this? <laughs> why are we moving into these innovations knowing that we don't have the money to continue them and we don't have the workforce with the right skills? There's imbalances in power between health and social care come up again and again. And also this problem around many innovations being introduced in the context of a project. So you end up with cliff edges around funding and that affects the, the continuation. So these are key things that seem to be important to think about addressing. OK, hopefully I'm not doing too badly with time and I can do a bit of a summing up. OK, right. Um, so. One of the key things that I think we really found from this is that if we want to uh, help the sector to think about how they can you know, improve the way they innovate, how they can develop startups, spread these innovations, then really we need a kind of step change in how we do 
research uh, around innovation. So I've put a list of things here and we're trying to take some of these through from Saski, but obviously we're not gonna solve this by ourselves and it would be good to see more research that takes this kind of perspective. Um, so studying the process of innovation, looking at Greeno as a journey, studying all the phases, not just looking at implementation. Comparative designs are absolutely critical. There's really a kind of lack of those. And I think that's where you start to see and understand how things spread and to be able to compare the, the realities of how the context might be influencing what's going on. As I hope has come through, the really the importance of using the, the wider literature around innovation, organizational and management literature to investigate these innovation processes. You know, what we found was how important, how valuable those were in helping us to understand that kind of more mechanistic questions that, that there will be for people who are really practicing this, who are trying to, to innovate. Um, and attending, I think importantly, to more of the kind of features of the adult social care system and how these influence the innovation processes. Um, there just really wasn't much of that kind of sense of, um, you know, the, the kind of context, the market context, for example, that people were operating in regulation. All these things didn't really come up in the literature, but we would have expected them to, given what stakeholders were telling us. OK, and then I suppose coming back to what I think I promised really with the talk about how we can support the sector to innovate and particularly thinking about the white paper itself, which is which is really trying to do that. It's trying to, you know, investing, promising the investment of money uh, in the sector to help them to innovate. So kind of key test, I suppose, of the work we've done so far is how can the research that we've done help and inform the implementation of the white paper? What's useful? What should we be telling DHSC from, from what we've done here? So I think there are a few things that, that we can say. Um, the first is this kind of issue of making sure that we engage at the outset with things that we know are a problem, that we know are structural weaknesses out there in social care. There isn't much point doing an innovation if we don't have the money in place to continue it afterwards, for example. Dealing with some of these problems and addressing them up front, trying to develop solutions and build that kind of learning and solution building. I think a little bit like John was saying, really, when he's talking about the, the things that they're doing with the implementation center, but building that kind of testing, learning and thinking as developing solutions into the, the innovation process. And I think the, the important thing that we do need to recognize as researchers is that we definitely don't have all the answers. Um, experiential knowledge is gonna be critical and, and really important to the implementation of the white paper aspirations. But I think what I really want to kind of emphasize from the work that we've done is that, yes, it's important, but I don't think it should crowd out, you know, insights that we can gain from the wider innovation, organizational management literature. Um, the issue then is how we mobilize that evidence. How do we make sure that we bring, you know, all that wealth of research and thinking and, and you know ideas into how we approach um, you know the supporting of, of innovation within adult social care. So I think you know the way we conducted our literature review hopefully points to one way in which it might be possible to do that. Um, so as I said, what we did with that review is we we took a theoretical lens, we took an idea, this idea of organizational capabilities from the resource-based view literature. We applied that to the evidence to interpret it, to see what there was there that could help us answer questions that we thought were pertinent to, to the issue. And then we were able to identify from that things that we knew were gonna help and things that we didn't knew, as Nick didn't know rather. And essentially that kind of lays the foundation for what I've described here as a kind of agenda for action really. Um, and I called it an agenda for action for, for a host of reasons, but I think it was to distinguish it from being a research agenda really. This isn't an agenda for research, this is an agenda for uh, researchers to work with practitioners, policy makers, different people to kind of experiment and, and develop solutions to some of the problems that we're identifying. So just to kind of summarize what our agenda for action would be then for DHSC from the review that we did, I think it would be around supporting um, the organize, organizational and system learning around building and embedding these key capabilities that we've identified for innovation. And as I said, that that should be informed by experiential insights, but also um, from the theoretical literature. Okay, hopefully I'm not doing too badly. So just, just to end by talking to you a little bit about where we're going for Saski. So as I mentioned, um, we've got some case studies that we're doing um, now. 
um, and for the remainder of the project. Um, these are kind of informed by a much more sort of longitudinal process perspective. We're looking at organizations as innovators, we're looking at systems as innovators, and we're following the career of an innovation here, shared lives. We've also got some cross-cutting analysis of those case studies um, where we're kind of drawing on ideas from the wider literature in order to understand processes that are happening more. So here focusing around the use of research evidence, particularly also around the economic evidence. We've got another strand that's looking at the idea of kind of coping with today and creating tomorrow. So that balance between innovating, but also doing what you need to do uh, as, you know, to keep the organization going while, while, you know, you're thinking about how to make it better. Um, and then something around how we create system change. We've also got some witness seminars that we're still building the program around that. And also we're going to be doing a survey of adult social care organizations, which will be particularly focused on that idea of innovation capabilities, understanding how they're distributed across the sector, and also thinking about perceptions um, that there are around innovation. And I think that's, that's it. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you, Juliet. You really got through a lot in the time. Well done. <laughs> and uh, people have been uh, posting lots of things about it in the chat that you might want to have a look at. We'll come back to the questions later. Thanks so much for that. I'm going to quickly move us on to Lisa, who's going to give us our final three presentations. Thanks, Annette. And, and thanks, John and uh, Juliet, for setting me up. No anecdote here. The timing will probably be off, So, um, but we'll give it our best shot. Um, so, um, Hello, everybody, from a very lovely sunny Cardiff. So um, I know most of you think it rains all the time in Cardiff. Not today, which is nice, um, but it'll probably cloud over in the process of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, essentially how relationships are core to everything um, that we're doing in innovation, but also in some of the work that we're doing around knowledge mobilization and evidence implementation along the lines of the, the work that John was talking about. So I'm going to talk to you about three projects, one of which is directly linked to innovation, um, but we're quite early on that journey. So the other two are, are much more kind of broad case studies about how we're engaging with the people we work with to um, implement evidence, innovation, a whole range of things. So first of all, there are some um, Welsh colleagues on the call, I'm very pleased to see, but most of you um, are probably in England, probably don't know who Social Care Wales is, so I'm just going to give you some quick background. Um, we're an organisation that was established in 2017, we're sponsored by Welsh Government and our sponsor is on the call, which is great to see. Um, we work across both adults and children's social care, and we have three aims. So, so the first is um, increasing public public confidence in care. Um, and what that essentially means is registering the workforce. So um, some of you may not know that in Wales, we are registering all care workers, not just social workers, um, which is a very different picture to the uh, current situation in England and gives us all sorts of opportunities with reaching out to our workforce, which um, unfortunately don't always exist. Um, we develop the workforce, so we look after qualifications, we look after the um, social work um, degree programmes, uh, we, we um, support local authorities and providers with schemes like apprenticeships, so all sorts of schemes there. And then finally, where we in the research data and innovation team sit in is in improving care and support. So we have a remit in Wales to support um, the mainly professional workforce as opposed to unpaid carers, um, but regulated and regulated across local authorities and across independent sector and third sector organisations. So that's who we are. Um, our team looks after the following. We lead on, um, just to say, I've, there's a, a slide at the end with lots of um, links to these um, documents and our website and stuff. So um, hopefully everything you might want to look up will be on that slide. Um, so we lead on something called the Social Care Research and Development Strategy, which sets out our aims and ambitions around um, not just doing research in social care, but around skills and using evidence and data, um, how we set priorities for research. We're also leading on something called the Strategic Approach to Social Care Data, which is a really exciting project to try to transform the way we use data in Wales and not just the bean counting and research data, but how do you empower citizens with their data to um, improve their experience and outcomes. And what we focus on, we focus on 
what we see is connecting people around research and data. We don't do research. What we want to do is bring people together. Um, and we like, um, so we also use a very broad description of evidence to include practitioner wisdom and the um, experiences of people with um, who use care and support. But we have a very special, special specific remit to promote research and data. Um, not that we privilege them over the other forms, but those are the things that we're principally um, supporting local authorities and providers to do. We are building skills and capabilities. We provide data and insights. I can also give you lots more on that, but I won't now. Um, and finally, this new um, role um, around setting out a strategic approach for supporting innovation. So it's worth pointing out that there's a very different policy context in Wales, and I never get tired of seeing this little chap on this policy document. I think he's just delightful. Um, so that's a healthier Wales, which is a, a very aspirational policy document setting out how um, we we want health and social care to appear in Wales. And you know, worth it's not a difficult read, so worth seeking out. Um, but from a legislative point of view, we, we're totally different from England. And, and I know that through the pandemic, you'll have started to see some of that difference um, at a very visible level. Um, so we have something called the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, um, which was implemented in 2014 and has four principal um, domains um, that you can see there. We have something really groundbreaking called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is um, around how all policy and legislation has to be reviewed from a sustainability perspective and what it will mean for future generations in Wales. And then finally, something much more niche, but is important because it's, uh, it's how um, Social Care Wales um, is, um, is uh, set up, is under the Regulation and Inspection of Social Care Act. So um, worth having a look at some of those if you aren't aware of them. So, but what's I think really also quite, I think reassuring about being in Wales is that we don't have any illusions about the job that we have to do around improvement and, and embedding evidence. Um, th this is a quote, and, and I think one of the really nice things about this, this is a, um, an evaluation project carried out by um, the University of South Wales and Swansea University, but commissioned by Welsh Government and published by Welsh Government, which I think is really telling um, that Welsh Government has the Welsh government, as you call it in England, um, the Welsh government has published um, uh, a very, very honest appraisal of where we are with the social services and wellbeing act. And this, this is a quote, I think, which um, just encapsulates where the gap is between um, the rhetoric and, and the reality of day to day life. So I think important because um, for us, that's the reason why we're doing this. Um, it's not about getting innovation out there. It's about how do we close this gap um, between our aspiration and what's really happening. So I'm going to tell you about three projects. The first is um, briefly about how we, we are using user research to develop our approach to support and innovation. And one of the things coming out of that is um, how Social Care Wales um, has a potential role as a convener. Um, and that's a kind of... Um, a sort of role that we've taken on in two existing projects. So I'll, I thought I'd tell you about those as well. One is around building a digital community management approach around evidence. And the other is the work that we've been doing with Health Technology Wales to expand its involvement in social care. And I pick these out because they're very much, um, they're really good examples about how we're trying to build communities and collaboration and work very closely with our partners in an iterative way. So first of all, um, we recently, and, and I have a throwaway line at the bottom, the project builds on the findings of the Saski project. We actually had some really helpful conversations with Juliet um, Valentina about um, what was coming out of the early findings. So we've skipped the peer review bit and we're going straight to using some of the findings to, to crack on with a few things. Um, so we, like in England, we have lots of examples of social care innovation, but few Across even within you know the the 22 local authorities in Wales. So why is this? So we commissioned um, part of Nesta and um, a lovely design group at Cardiff University called Erlab, 
to deliver a user research program um, to work pe with people in innovation. So you'll see if you um, are close to Juliet's project that we've already um, picked out the three contingent groups. So the innovators, the enablers, and then the people who'll benefit from innovation, even though we've called them something different there. And the purpose of the project is to help us develop an action plan to support the spread and scale of innovation um, and to connect the policy the national policy with the reality experienced on the ground, which is what I just uh, alluded to on the previous slide. So where we've got to, so, so first of all, actually, I thought I'd just say a bit about user research because it's not necessarily um, a concept that we have used a lot in social care. We are very, I think, much better than healthcare around co-production. Um, but what has been interesting over the last few years, and, and Annette's got a really lovely project running um, with her research practice partnership using re user research and design principles. Um, this is all um, focused on human-centered or user-centered research um, and design. So it's not just um, about bringing information together. It's about understanding things quite deeply, but not so so the big difference for me is that it's not about gathering loads and loads of information and you know there then as something emerges um what you do within a user research process is test and prototype and and run things past people and and ask them um you know very meaningful and practical questions about how things might work um i i haven't got time to go into it hugely but i think the next slide with the sorts of things that are coming out kind of helps understand how it um, the sorts of results that you get from it. So what, what we've learned during that process so far, and as I say, it, we're at the early stages and our lab have just um, talked us through their high level findings. But the sorts of things that we um, have coming out of there is, um, there, are, there are three popular um, ways of supporting communities that um, or people working in social care um, to support innovation. One is around community of practice approach, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Um, another one is something John talked about a bit, you know, quite a bit, which is this having protected space and time. There's, um, you know, there are lots of structural reasons why people can't adopt innovation or use evidence in social care. And a lot of them are around just simply having the time and, and the um, size of caseload or enough staff to enable you to test and learn and um, discuss um, questions with others, with peers. And then the final one is, is support and experimentation and training. So there were some other things, as, as you can see, working on career pathways. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time on gathering quantitative data. People were very um, keen to look at qualitative data and how we tell stories about innovation and evidence. There's something about how we induct staff, you know, how, if we, how can we expect staff to be um, innovative and creative if, you know, they're, they're recruited and inducted in a, a very compliance um, compliance focused environment. And then there's something about walking in other's shoes to understand how innovation and evidence and experiences vary across different groups. So for Social Care Wales, because one of the key things is, OK, what does that mean for us as an organisation? What can we do to support this ecosystem of innovation? And there were three things. Um, the first was to make use of our Pan Wales responsibilities and remit to play a convening role. And as I said, I'm going to go back to that in a second. The second is to explore um, how to embed innovation to practice and contracts. So, you know, how we commission, how we train, how we induct. And then finally, to create a platform as a central repository for knowledge and ideas. So those are the three things. I'm just going to focus a little bit on us as a convener in other areas to give you a sense of how we've gone about operationalizing that. So two case studies um, projects. I'm going to talk about this digital community management approach. I'm not I'm also going to talk about a collaboration that we've had with Health Technology Wales um, to expand its involvement. So the first one is our digital community management approach. Um, so this is part of a long term multi layered project to support knowledge mobilization and evidence use in social care Wales and now really starting to apply it to innovation. Um, it came on the back of some engagement or quite a bit of engagement we've done over the last few years with local authorities and providers, um, mainly with Sky. So there's a link to that report um, in the back of uh, 
this presentation if it would be useful. So we talk about, you know, what local authorities wanted um, to help them use evidence. Um, and finally, and really importantly, is we're getting really lovely expert guidance and support from an organisation called Social Finance, which many of you will be familiar with, but have really transformed the way that we thought about this. Um, a big shout out, I know she's not on the call, to um, one of their teams, Sam Villis, who has been a brilliant coach and mentor in um, supporting our learning in this whole area. So we've all got um, ideas about what communities could look like. And, and one of the first things we could do is talk with our internal improvement managers um, who have worked, you know, many of them for many, many years um, in improvement roles in local authorities and also in practice. And the the sorts of things that they told us, uh, the sorts of things that you would expect to, I'm sure if you thought um, about some of the groups that you would get involved with, the, the things that they were concerned about were mostly about dominant, me, don, dominant voices. And I know that we'll all refer to the usual suspects or the same old faces or, and so, you know, there's something really important about breaking out of some of those kind of niches and cliques and groups. Um, that was really important to them. Um, they also wanted their groups to have a much bigger say in how you define the, the content of sessions and groups and networks and, and make groups much more um, self-managing. Um, but, you know, on balance, um, people within our organisation are really keen that we, can, we create communities um, that are places to learn and share, but also where people can go and get support from their peers. And one of the great opportunities in Wales is we're much smaller than England, um, you know, 22 local authorities. I'm not saying everybody knows everybody, but it is much easier to create some community around some of these, um, some of these questions. So we also went out to um, some, so, so we had canvassed opinion and, and got people involved. We've got um, a lot of people around the country who are keen on being part of this community. And so we've been working with them essentially to co-design what the community looks like. So we've had um, survey activity going on, but the next phases of the community will involve the community designing bits of the community rather than us um, imposing um, a design upon them. So you can see here some of the findings. What do people tell us? Well, they told us that they wanted a space for dialogue, um, learning. They wanted to make sure that there were lots of ways of meeting. Um, they wanted it to be very practical so that the, you know, it's learning that they can use in their day to day work. They also wanted to build relationships. They told us about some of the things they're interested in. Um, and then it, they also wanted to share with each other and um, impart their own knowledge and experience with others. So what have we learned so far? Well, first of all, one, one thing that's really interesting is since we started on this journey, I think we you know, can't move for people trying to set up communities of practice um, around different topics, whether it be innovation or different types of social care. Um, and what we've learned with social finances is, is a real need to design each community very mindfully and to make sure each community has a very clear purpose statement. Um, a community manager role is key and a lot of this learning is from the private sector. Um, so digital community managers exist um, across private sector organisations and some of you will work with, will you know, be customers of organisations that are very active. So GIFGAF is one that has a very active community manager. And one, one of the things I forgot to say earlier is that we've always wanted to set up some communities of practice. And I think that the last two years of um, the pandemic and people moving online has given us a little bit of um, boldness, I guess, to do something digitally. Um, so I think previously we would have feared away from it. I know not everybody can access digital, but for us, you know, there are so many opportunities that have come up during the pandemic, but also in Wales, even though we're a very small country, transport is not that great. So actually bringing people together nationally is really hard physically. Um, so digital, a digital community management approach for us has all sorts of opportunities. Also, lots of opportunities emerging for our innovation and improvement work um, that we have already started to look at. Technology is important for a digital community, but it's trumped by the human elements. There's not much different between an online community and an offline community in terms of the work you have to put in to recruit and build processes and think about purpose statements. 
And finally, we've learned, as we all know intuitively, that communities are not self-sustaining, at least initially. So if you are interested in communities of practice, I'm going to give a big up to this book, that this um, this uh, graph or, or diagram is um, cited from. Um, there's some really good practical tips um, to how and, and what you do to run a community. So I haven't got too much time, but I just wanted to quickly canter through the third project. Um, and this is a really nice example of where we've worked with a health partner, um, in this case, Health Technology Wales, um, really closely to try and adapt their work to the social care context. So Health Technology Wales um, is funded by Welsh Government to provide health technology assessment for non-medicines technologies. And the early focus was very much on health, but um, over the last two years, three years, um, we've really been working closely together to, to try and adapt their um, their processes to social care and the reason I brought this along is even though it seems like a very small uh, example it's an example of where just putting in the hard yards meeting after meeting after meeting um, can um, really um, unleash some or, or reap benefits so the slides will be around afterwards um, but just briefly we ran around table we had a great virtual workshop to redesign the application process so how you um, how you actually um, propose a topic um, a, a very um, well thought through workshop where we literally went through every form accessibility guidelines everything using a case study um, so you know the the preparation for the workshop took days and days and days to make sure that it could be productive um, we proposed the start intervention as a case study, but then proposed it as a real intervention. And, and some of you will be really familiar with this, um, this intervention. It's for people who um, care for people with dementia, so family carers, um, to improve their mental health. So I'm absolutely delighted to say that we threw it into the ring. Um, and now um, policy in Wales is that this intervention should be approved, should be implemented um, by every health board. Um, lots of questions around implementation that we could come back to, um, but just the principle that we have a decision that is to um, adopt something that is radically, well, not radically different, but really focused and effective and um, and productive and you know just great for families of people with dementia so we're absolutely delighted to have put that into the ring what did we learn we learned that um, the process is really iterative um, you know we round table workshop tons and tons of meetings in between loads of emails going back and forth um, but we think the investment in the relationship has reaped benefits um, we started this process with a social care topic call that elicited none no um, proposals in 2019 that could be um, evaluated for lots of different reasons and some of it I think was the application process but now we have 10 good proposals um, that are going through that system which is absolutely brilliant. Um, creating that real life case study was essential though because it gave us a case study to go back to all our social care proposers. We targeted people to ask them to propose um, interventions that we thought would be helpful. Um, we found that meaningful co-production requires an awful lot of detailed planning, but it really pays off. Um, and finally, one of my favorite expressions, but absolutely true here is these things, this looks really small. Um, and, but I think what it's shown to us is the benefits of just chipping away um, at these processes and just making sure that um, you form good relationships with stakeholders to, to try and push them through. So that's essentially all I was going to talk about today. As I said, there is a slide here with lots of links for people who are interested in knowing more about Wales or more about some of these um, some of these um, interventions. And of course, do um, give me a call or email me um, if you'd require if you'd like more information. So thanks, Annette. I know it's a couple of minutes over. No, no, you were bang on. <laughs> exactly twenty minutes. So. Okay, so thank you all so much for your contributions today. I mean, I was really, really looking forward to this session and you really delivered, so thanks for that. And also um, for the fantastic contributions from the people in the audience, the chat has been really lively and interesting and um, there's lots there. And also, because um, I can see who's here, there's people from policy, practice and research. 
um, people who are involved in different sectors um, and thinking about this work in lots of different ways. I think that's such a value if we can keep hold of all those different perspectives in the work that we do. So we, we just wanted to flag up uh, that there are um, recordings online on our website of the previous webinars in this series. There's a fantastic one on learning from a crisis, on soft power in the clinic, and one on qualitative approaches, and then this one will be posted soon. Um, so if you've missed those and want to view them, they're, they're there to be seen. We'll be sharing the recording of this session and also the PowerPoints for you afterwards. So you've got the opportunity to look particularly at some of those really useful links that were in the presentations um, for you to go and kind of explore this area more. This is such a critical and important area as we develop our work in health and social care more generally that I think, you know, the more we have these opportunities, to talk and to think and reflect together and to learn together then the better and great to see so many people turn up today. Um, I just wanted to finish really by recognising Martin Stevens who we've sadly lost from this field um, uh, last week and was a great role model to many of us about how to work together and how to do the best work we can um, for the sector so um, that feels to me like it's a moment that we can recognise that. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, there will be another seminar later on in the year and it'd be great if you could join us. And uh, yeah, and thanks again for all your participation through the chat and for making the time to join us today. And thanks to our fantastic speakers, John Glasby, Lisa Trigg and Juliet Malley for really putting a lot of work into thinking about what to share with us today. So thank you for that. <laughs>